that's hilarious. Vlad acting like he has elections. Oh my word, that's so funny. <laughs> Have you seen the, the Russian presidential ballot? It's like Putin, Putin again, or prison. That's what it is. <laughs> it's also funny to think that there are Russian voters who were gonna vote for Putin until they got banned from the Olympics, or the people are just like, I don't know about Putin anymore. Next year, I will vote for Jill Stein. Nah. <laughs> really? You don't see any reason not to trust Vladimir Putin? The man was a top KGB spy. He'll steal the shirt off your back. Hell, he stole the shirt off his own back. <laughs> you can't trust this man. On the list of people to never trust, Putin is right between WebMD and the mom from Get Out. <laughs> In the normal rules of spying, when something like this happens, everyone denies everything. But Vladimir Putin is not playing by the normal rules. President Putin, BBC News. Uh, is Russia behind the poisoning of Sergei Skripal? <laughs> We're busy with agriculture here to create good conditions for people's lives. And you talk to me about some tragedies. First work out what actually happened there, and then we'll talk about it. Wait, he didn't even bother to deny it. <laughs> Nobody's so busy with agriculture that they can't answer a murder charge. <laughs> what was that? Did you kill him? Shh, I'm rotating my crops. <laughs> okay, fine, Russian, so what? Yeah, I make it up to America. I buy you pizza. I know a good place. <laughs> like, Putin is clearly on top of the world right now. And the more anyone tries to corner him, the more fun he has. If the 13 Russian nationals plus three Russian companies did, in fact, interfere in our elections, is that okay with you? <laughs> I don't care. I couldn't care less. Okay, how long has he been practicing that evil laugh? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Russia. Ra He's doing USA. What the hell is that? Russia. That's not, it's Russia. 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 USA. That's America's rhythm. Get your own chant, you big jerk. Yeah. But great news for Vladimir Putin. He has won the election. Now, I know some people are concerned about how he won. There are fears he may have colluded with Russia. But either way, <laughs> it was a landslide. Putin got 77% of the vote. His closest rival, Pavel Grudinin, got 12%, and Jill Stein got 5%. <laughs> no, no, I'm messing with you, I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. Putin got 77%, and the other guy got poisoned. <laughs> Vladimir Putin is preparing for a longer and more intense war on Ukraine. In a speech carried nationally in Russia, the president said he will put up 300,000 military reservists to active duty. Vladimir Putin's been pushed into a corner, warning the West he still has weapons of mass destruction, read that as nuclear, and he's prepared to use them. We will use all the means at our disposal to protect Russia and our people, he said. This is not a bluff. Wow. Wow, wow, seriously, Putin? Nukes, the N-word? Not cool, man, not cool. <laughs> That's America's word to use. <laughs> he does sound serious, though, huh? You heard him, you heard what he said. He said, this is not a bluff. Although, to be fair, this is not a bluff is what someone who's bluffing would say. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be very effective if he was like, I will nuke entire world, but I am bluffing, so don't worry. <laughs> By the way, I know this is random, but I found it funny that he has the two landlines behind him in the picture. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I get the one, the one. Maybe that's for, like, the nuclear codes. But what's the other line for, right? <laughs> is he also, like, a part-time telemarketer? Just like, Mr. Androbov, I'm preparing for nuclear war, which is why life insurance is very important right now. <laughs> Could I introduce you to a plan? <laughs> you know, one of the most frustrating things about this war is that the only reason it's still going on is because Vladimir Putin is trying to save face, right? He just, he just doesn't want to be seen to be losing. And it, it, it made me wonder, do you think Putin knows how to lose? Like, do you think he knows how? Because think about it. The dude plays an annual hockey game where the Russian team lets him score 32 goals, <laughs> right? He somehow wins the judo contest against professionals every year. <laughs> So it actually wouldn't surprise me that he can't accept the concept that he can lose. You know, it, it's, it's almost like when parents let their kids win everything. 
And when they're like, wow, Billy, you ran so fast, you win again. <laughs> then the kid grows up thinking that losing isn't a part of life, right? That's why when I raced my four-year-old nephew last weekend, I <laughs> smoked his ass. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> Left him in the dust. Yeah. Then I gave him a rematch, and I smoked his ass again! <laughs> Woo! I mean, yes, he cried. Yes, he cried. But you know what he won't do? Invade Ukraine. Yeah. We can place 100% of the blame for all of it on Joe Biden and John Kerry. This war is the Green New Deal war. There's much blame to go around Colonel Vidman, uh, Adam Schiff, Nancy Pelosi. It all happened because of a rigged election. Look, Russia is now being canceled. Well, folks, the wussification of America is on full display, and Vladimir Putin is going to waltz right in and conquer one of the largest countries in Europe. There they all sat on Friday in the White House, wearing their ludicrous face coverings. Do they have any idea how weak that made America look? Our military chiefs cowering in pathetic little masks. I think you can say, well, Putin's out of his mind. Yes, maybe so. But at the same time, he's being compelled by God. Could it be? that Greta Thunberg and Leonardo DiCaprio actually might be to blame for what Vladimir Putin is doing. Russia has invaded Ukraine. Why is this happening? What does it mean? Where is Hillary Clinton's email server? Well, I've been watching Fox News for 648 hours straight, and I'm ready to fox blame Ukraine. Why did Putin invade Ukraine? The answer's complex, but let me try to explain. Burisma, critical race gender, Minnie Mouse in a pantsuit. Don't believe me? Take a look inside the gender neutral bathroom in Hunter Biden's laptop. This is happening because President Biden is weak. When Donald Trump was president, Putin didn't meddle in Ukraine. He meddled in America. Putin is strong and Biden is weak. America needs a strong leader. By the way, why are we supposed to think that Vladimir Putin is evil? He's not the one poisoning our children with critical race theory. Vladimir Putin is evil. I have always said that. I have never said that Vladimir Putin is a handsome genius with a hottie's body. Let me be clear. Vladimir Putin is a handsome genius with a hottie's body. He is a tyrannical leader. He was not democratically elected and he alone is responsible for this. I'm talking about Joe Biden, if that isn't clear. Sanctions? Really, Joe? We need to be sending cruise missiles, Chevy cruises, Penelope cruises, Norwegian cruise lines. We need to do far more to support our allies in Yugoslavia. Ukraine. Ukraine. Tom Cruises, Terry Cruises, Booz Cruises, Booz Allen, Tim Allen, Allen Iverson? You know what could solve this crisis in minutes? Ivermectin. Vladimir Putin, if I was your mother, I wouldn't make you wear a mask at school. Vladimir Putin is evil, but in some ways, he's a hero. But in more ways, he's a villain, a strong villain, a patriot, a tyrant, <laughs> a menace, a mensch. Pete Buttigieg took maternity leave? Vladimir Putin rode a bear. He's evil though, yet seductive. Vladimir Putin supports Trump. I also support Trump. Does that make me Vladimir Putin? Russia is basically being canceled. First Mr. Potato Head, now Mr. Putin Head. And that's pretty much all you need to know about the Ukraine situation according to Fox News. NATO's run by vampires. Are you a conservative who praised Vladimir Putin and now wish you hadn't? Then you need Tyranol, the drug that makes you forget you applauded a tyrant who is now slaughtering civilians. This miracle pill can help you go from this. It might be worth asking, why do I hate Putin so much? Why do I why care about what's going on in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia? And why shouldn't I root for Russia, because which I am? To this. Vladimir Putin started this war. He is to blame for what we're seeing tonight in Ukraine. Incredible. Tyranol works by invading your sovereign mind and attacking any previously held memories or beliefs. Just listen to this satisfied customer. Vladimir Putin is a very talented statesman. I consider him a elegantly sophisticated counterpart. We've seen a Russian dictator now terrorize the Ukrainian people. And if you've been praising Putin for years, then try Tyranol Extended Release. Putin has done a, an amazing job. Putin has much better leadership qualities than Obama. President Putin was extremely strong and powerful. President Putin is sharp. He's a guy who's very savvy. I know him very well. You have not only Putin, you have other people that are stone cold murderers and thugs and dictators that are very dangerous. Tyranol extended release is not 100% effective. Tyranol may cause side effects, including permanent resting constipation phase in some patients. It's time to stop regretting and start forgetting. Tyranol, out with the Vlad, in with the good.
Can a leader be too perfect? He's a superhero. He's some kind of Superman for us. Can his flawless intellect and unmatched strength make him somehow more than a man? Russia! Russia! At what point does a mortal ruler become a living god? Will I be sitting here till I'm 100 years old? This is the daily showography of Vladimir Putin, democracy's super star. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin grew up with everything a Soviet child could ever want. Communal housing. And that's it. We lived in a small room, all three of us, in a communal apartment in Leningrad with no private facilities. We didn't even have our own bath or shower. It was all the fun of a college dorm, but with way more drinking. From birth, greatness was in his blood. His father was a party member, and his grandfather was a cook for Joseph Stalin, giving Vladimir access to all the flavors of Soviet Russia, from bland to cold to gray. It was a movie that set Putin on his life's path. The Shield and the Sword, about a dashing Soviet spy, inspired him to join the KGB. He'd be the Russian James Bond, meaning the guy trying to kill James Bond. By 1985, Putin was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB, stationed in glamorous East Germany. But in 1989, tragedy struck. A crowd of Germans, driven mad by the decadent Western influences of Coca-Cola and blue jeans, descended upon the Berlin Wall. They smashed it to bits, and then, looking for more souvenirs they could later sell to history nerds, they gathered around Putin's station. The Berlin Wall might have fallen, but a great man does not crumble so easily. Putin ran to the basement and set all the KGB's documents on fire. Then he went outside and told the crowd they would be shot if they didn't leave. What an honor for those Germans to be there for the future leader's first death threat. Through his heroic actions that day, Putin survived. But sadly, the Soviet Union did not. When I say that the fall of the USSR was one of the greatest catastrophes of the 20th century, I'm talking about a humanitarian catastrophe above all. After the dissolution of the USSR, 25 million Russians suddenly found themselves in a foreign country. That's right. Millions of Russians had to order whole new address labels. Was the downfall of communism really worth that? But Russia and Putin persevered. Under the steady leadership of the incredibly competent Boris Yeltsin, Putin rose through the political ranks, eventually becoming prime minister. The Russian public wanted to know, who was this young and objectively perfect man? To answer that, Putin commissioned a documentary about his life, just like Beyonce. And Putin's film? was even cooler. He commissioned this rarely seen documentary about himself. Presenting Vladimir Putin, the credits read, in power. Weirdly, the soundtrack is from the Broadway show Cats. It was without question the second most disturbing movie ever to feature songs from Cats. In 1999, Boris Yeltsin abruptly resigned from the presidency to spend more time with his drinking problem. And Putin became the second elected and first permanent president of Russia. He proved himself not just a formidable head of state, but a man of many talents. A beast master. An adventurer, a sportsman, and a born entertainer. Vladimir Putin is truly a quadruple threat. Quintuple if one of the threats is making actual threats. But most of all, President Putin is a protector of Russia's fragile democracy. Good 
A role he takes so seriously that every election he does whatever is necessary to stop inferior candidates from winning. For this devotion, his citizens have rewarded him with the presidency again and again by literally unbelievable margins. Vladimir Putin will lead Russia for another six years. He cruised to an expected victory in yesterday's presidential election, winning nearly 77% of the vote. Check this brazen ballot stuffing caught on camera. In these videos verified by the AP, voters seem to insert multiple ballots. One election official appears to stroll over to a box, stuff it, while no one in the room seems to mind. Yes, Putin respects people's right to vote so much that he lets them vote two, three, or 78 times in the same election. It wasn't all smooth sailing, though. One time, Putin briefly had to let a friend be president for him until he could run again. And then he had to make a tiny change to the Constitution so he could run again again. And again. As Russia has thrived, so has the man who embodies it. For his steadfast commitment to fighting corruption, Russian oligarchs and energy executives have gifted Putin with tens of billions of dollars. My personal suspicion is that certainly Mr. Putin is the richest man in Europe, possibly on the planet. Money, money. Yeah, I need it, my hands and that money would come in handy when unexpected expenses cropped up, like secretly buying a luxury apartment in Monaco for a totally random woman. And yes, one media outlet claimed that the woman was Putin's mistress, but that's ridiculous. Putin was happily married at the time. And also that media outlet has since been outlawed. Besides, these rumors are completely unfair to the woman's daughter, whose unknown father must be very proud of her and her face that looks absolutely nothing like Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Of course, even a perfect country has some malcontents, but whenever those seeking to undermine Putin's streak of uncorrupt democracy begin to circle him like bloodthirsty sharks, somehow, some way, fate always intervenes on his behalf. There seems, for some reason, to be an extremely high mortality rate among independent journalists and political opponents of Mr. Putin. President Putin dismissed accusations that the Russian state was behind the attack on Mr. Navalny. If our agents had wanted to kill him, he said, they'd have finished the job. Is Russia behind the poisoning of Sergei Skripal? Look, we're busy here with agriculture, and you ask me about some tragedies. Get to the bottom of things there first, then we'll talk about this. Yeah, why doesn't anyone ever ask Putin about his agriculture programs? Like these new bananas he's working on that grow with the poison already inside them. Sure, it's true that some of Putin's critics met untimely ends, but on the other hand, let's move on. We should be talking about agriculture. Naturally, a true champion of democracy doesn't just want it for his own country. He wants it for all people, which is why Putin began tirelessly assisting with elections around the world, sending his digital democracy helpers to gently nudge voters in the right direction. Putin was so amazing at democracy that in 2016, even the world's so-called greatest democracy was asking for his help. Russia, if you're listening, and like the great man he is, Putin answered the call. Tonight, Russian President Vladimir Putin trolling the United States, joking about meddling in the presidential election and saying he'll do it again. I'll tell you a secret. Yes, of course we'll do it, to finally make you happier. Just don't tell anyone. You know what they say. It takes a big man to joke about himself and an even bigger, scarier man to joke about destroying your country. Yeah. That's why in all the world there is no bigger man than Vladimir Putin. How grateful we are for his 21-year reign, his guaranteed 16-year future reign, and if we should be so fortunate, his 100-year reign that. Welcome back to The Daily Show. My guest tonight is Ukraine's representative to the United Nations. He's here to talk about Russia's war in Ukraine. Here he is addressing his Russian counterparts at an emergency meeting of the UN Sec Security Council at the start of the war. 
that it's too late, my dear colleagues, to speak about de-escalation. Too late. The Russian president declared a war on the record. Should I play the video of your president? Ambassador, shall I do that right now? Or you can confirm it. Do not interrupt me, please. Thank you. Then don't ask me questions when you are speaking. Proceed with your, proceed with your statement. Anyway, you declare the war. It is the responsibility of this body to stop the war. Please welcome Ambassador Sergei Kislytsia. <laughs> Ambassador, welcome to the Daily Show. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You have a really position, a really interesting position and a, and a difficult undertaking right now because you are representing Ukraine at the UN and Ukraine is in one of the most precarious positions right now. Before we get into where we are, let's maybe clear up the beginning. How did this start and what is the cause of what we're seeing in Ukraine? Well, do you want a long story or you want a short version? <laughs> I guess we're on TV, well, the so the short version. Well, the long one is like 300 years. But the, long, the short one is uh, Putin came to power and uh, he probably promised himself that he would restore the Soviet empire. And ever since, uh, we are um, in the state of war and now we are in the state of hot war. I mean, actually, the war started not on the 24th of February. It started uh, back in... 2014. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you're in a position now where, as you said, I, li I like that you call it a hot war because it's a war that you know, people can see very clearly. There, there are many people who are being killed. There are tanks rolling in. It's, it's, a, it's a different type of war, though, because everybody agrees that Ukraine is in the right. Everybody agrees that Russia is doing something wrong. And yet, because of Russia being Russia, it seems like the United Nations and many other countries are scared to overact for fear of causing a world war. How, how do you then ask for help? And, and what, do you, what do you hope will be achieved if countries you know, have to balance this precarious position? Well, I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, for me, we are already in the Third World War, which may be kind of crazy to say. But uh, the 21st century is not the 20th century, where we had these standard wars with tanks uh, crossing the borders. Uh, we are in a hybrid world, and you don't really need to cross the border to attack uh, the United States. You can do that in the cyberspace, you know, or you can do like a terrorism or financial terrorism. So basically, um, we are there in the United Nations and the United Nations is a product of uh, three old gentlemen among uh, which were Joseph Stalin. So it's not perfect. And we still, uh, in the hundredth day of the war, we still have Russia sitting in front of us and we still pretend that we have to uh, respect it. And the only reason we respect Russian Federation is because, uh, well, I do not respect, but they have to respect. Uh, the, the, yeah, that, that's a very important correction. Because they, they, they possess the nuclear arsenal and they are really paranoid that Russia may use uh, nukes against them. So is, is your argument then that Russia shouldn't be sitting as one of those permanent members of the UN? Oh, first of all, Russia is not a permanent member, if you ask me. I mean, Russia occupied the seat of the Soviet Union back in 1991. The same way the Russia occupied Georgia, the same way Russia occupied uh, Transnistria in Moldova, the same way Russia invaded uh, uh, Syria. So uh, Russia occupies, 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 and we are all complacent with that. I mean, we were complacent with that until uh, the night of the 23rd. And all of a sudden, we were surprised that it happened. I mean, which was imminent for 30 years. But do you, do you think that maybe this has been you know, it, 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 everything in hindsight is 2020. You know, and, and, and I've read, you know, some historians who would argue that, you know, there could have been a way for the world to bring Russia into the fold from the very beginning. Some say the problem was the fact that Russia was pushed out. Russia felt like they were being isolated. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. felt like NATO was encroaching on their territory. If Putin was brought into the fold, he would have had a vested interest in being part of the world. Do, do, do you see any credence in that argument? Well, you know, I saw many Kremlinologists, or Sovietologists, as uh, they, call, they are called often, and they are tunneled with their vision of the world the same way like Germany was tunneled with Nord Stream, uh, you know. They saw the world through the tunnel of Nord Stream. And uh, we were, all of us, we are, uh, were guilty of uh, uh, letting Putin uh, grow as a dictator mm -hmm. uh, of uh, unprecedented scale in Europe. Um, probably Hitler was only the one we can compare him with. 
Uh, no, I don't believe in appeasement. I believe in the need to fight the virus. And uh, Russian uh, Putinism is the same as COVID, but it's only the in international politics COVID, you know. Right, right. And, 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 and it, it is taking its toll as well. You know, your, your, your country's in a position now where every day we read about how Russia is, is, is changing its tactics. You know, it's slowly becoming a war of attrition as opposed to a direct assault. You know, Ukraine has inspired the world in how, in how you're fighting back. You know, your, your president has been there staying in the country, you, you know, despite what everyone thought he would do. Um, when you get to the point, though, where it feels like European nations are almost encouraging Ukraine to in some way, you know, give up a piece of territory. You see many European nations saying, Ukraine, maybe you should just give them the Donbas region, just give them that part that has already expressed some sort of interest in becoming part of Russia. You have said that that is a complete non-starter, why? Yeah, it's absolutely, I mean, uh, unless everybody is amnesiac, you know, uh, let me remind it what happened in 1938 when Hitler signed uh, a Munich agreement with uh, Chamberlain. The New York Times literally, literally, ran an article, uh, and I can quote from it, the world has never been pregnant with hope as it is now. And then oh. what happened? Czechoslovakia lost one-fifth of its territory. The Nazi troops moved in. And then in less than 12 months, the Second World War started, and the whole Czechoslovakia was invaded. So basically, if people are not very cognizant of the history lessons. I, they have to go back to schools, I think. And uh, it's a duty of all of us to make them study the history. Are you worried that European countries may at some point say, this is too much for us and we, we don't know if we're gonna back Ukraine through this? Because we've seen, again, through history, Russia is not afraid to fight long, painful wars. You know, it seems like Vladimir Putin's not afraid to, to send his troops out onto the front lines and, and, and have them perish because he doesn't have to worry about an election that he's losing. You know, and approval is not his issue. And so if, if you're in that position, you know, Ukraine is in, is in a space where you have your, 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 your people who may get de demoralized. You know, you have a nation that is constantly bombarded. You know, obviously the U.S. is helping you. But, but what would you hope the next steps would be then? Where do you see the world moving towards to well, help Ukraine? Well, Trevor, you just came from Europe, uh, aren't you? Right? I did, yeah. Yeah, you, see, you saw it with your own eyes that Europe is not really homogeneous. Uh, it is so diverse. It's like a bouquet of nations. Right. So it would be kind of uh, overgeneralization to say that Europe believes, Europe says. I mean, we have wonderful, wonderful nations uh, like Poland, like the UK, uh, like uh, Portugal. I just uh, talked to the Portuguese ambassador, like uh, Baltic states. They will fight hard until the very end to defeat the Russian despotism. You know, we have some countries that got used to live in conflict for so long mm -hmm. that they are out of context altogether. Oh. But the thing is that if we do not defeat Putinism today, right? If we, we will be satisfied with just a military defeat of Russia in Ukraine, and we will uh, let this dictator to regrow his chopped back claws, they will hit all of you again, like in five or seven years from now, and then we all pay triple price for it. So even from the point of view of uh, investing money in Ukrainian uh, victory. Investing money in Ukrainian victory is investing money in your own security. And you should be all grateful that it is the Ukrainian soldiers, not the British soldiers, not the American soldiers, who are dying in the front, defending the collective democratic world, you know. So I have to remind about that to all uh, of our viewers and to all people in Europe, in North America, and not only there. I have to remind all Africans who will suffer from the food shortages in two months from now. A lot of people don't know about that. You know, I, I, I saw many people complaining about food prices going up. Many people in the Middle East and Africa struggling with, um, you know, a shortage of wheat and bread is, you know, exactly. one of the most important food sources. Uh, many people don't know how much of that grain is coming from Ukraine for the entire world. There are countries, there are countries that are 70% dependent on Ukrainian grain. And those countries are devastated with civil wars, or with droughts or with uh, uh, climate calamities, they have no way to go on the market and buy grain from somewhere else. So, I mean, from the, for them, it is a matter of survival. And the fact is that we have 21 million tons of grain sitting to be exported. Right. And we can't do that because one crazy 
little person in, in Kremlin does not really allow us to do that, you know. And that's, uh, that's amazing. I mean, that's amazing. And uh, one of the jobs uh, we have to do, one of the things we, we are doing currently in the United Nations, we are desperately seeking the way how to save millions of people who are literally under the threat of dying of starvation 10,000 miles away from, from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. you know, and that is why this conflict has so many implications that unlike in 2014, where we, when we were all happy to have 100 nations voting uh, in favor of the territorial integrity of Ukraine, we now have overwhelming majority. We have 141 nations that voted on the 2nd of March and that identify Russia as an aggressor state. You know, there were only four countries, such wonderful countries as North Korea and Syria, who voted in support of, of Russia. You know, and it's very important. It's very important because the world finally understood that it's not just about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's about the entire collective democratic community of nations. Thank you so much for joining us, Ambassador. Thank you for inviting. I appreciate the time.